we interrupt this program. This is a national emergency. Important instructions will follow. What you just heard a few moments ago amid the blaring sirens was the emergency alert system. You may have heard one or both of these during a severe weather event like a tornado, but something we don't think about is that they were originally designed for a nuclear attack with automated announcements on the airwaves calling for people to seek shelter. Of course, if you're in a house or even a concrete building within the blast radius of a nuclear explosion, you won't be so lucky. In a World War III scale nuclear attack with potentially thousands of bombs exchanged, entire cities and thus entire populations would be wiped from existence. The most remote areas, rural areas, would be the safest from immediate attack but would still be subject to nuclear fallout and the breakdown of civil society just beyond their borders. In Star Trek's fictional timeline, World War III is one of the most consequential events in human history. Occurring from 2026 to 2053, it serves as the culmination of the so-called eugenics wars, conflicts fought over genetic engineering, and results in the deaths of over 600 million people. It sets humanity back culturally, resulting in a second dark age marked by disease, famine, and other ills amid the collapse of democratic governments. Most nation states effectively cease to exist on a functional level, with their powers usurped by corporations, terrorist factions, and despots. But while against all odds, scientific advancement continues, marked by the invention of faster-than-light travel by Zephram Cochran, suffering would also continue for decades all around the globe. Earth's transition to becoming a member of the interstellar community is a slow and painful one, plagued by continued resource skirmishes, totalitarianism, and overall bleakness in society. These conditions would take until at least the early 22nd century to be resolved. In this video, I want to examine the history that led up to World War III, how it likely unfolds, uh, what nations are affected, if any are unaffected, and how a nuclear conflict might actually play out in real life. I also want to examine how the so-called post-atomic horror of the late 21st century causes human society to unravel even more than it had before the war broke out, and how, with the help of the Vulcans, Earth is able to right itself and forge a new outlook in the 22nd century. This is Star Trek Earth's World War III Explained. A third world war has been a growing concern ever since the end of the second one in 1945. While the establishment of the United Nations, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, or NATO, and various other international institutions was meant to help prevent future conflicts between nations, these organizations have been in many ways ineffective. Escalation of the Cold War towards a nuclear exchange has always been a somewhat unlikely but still possible scenario, from the Cuban Missile Crisis to a couple other close calls during the 1980s. It was only because cooler heads prevailed in many of these situations that this escalation never occurred and humanity lived to see another day. Powers such as the United States, our allies, and our adversaries, possessing rather large nuclear stockpiles throughout modern history, has been a double-edged sword, no doubt. On the one hand, it has ensured via the MAD doctrine, 
mutually assured destruction, that nations are deterred from using these weapons due to their destructive capability. On the other hand, though, all it takes is a radical leader of any one nation to launch an offensive strike and start a chain reaction that ends in nuclear annihilation. At the time the original series was written, there were hints that World War III was supposed to happen in the 1990s, during the reign of Khan Noonien Singh and the Augments, the global conflict among these Augment dictators, known as the Eugenics Wars, led to 30 million deaths. Since the original series, further distinctions have been made between the 1990s Eugenics Wars and the real World War III, quote unquote, a distinction introduced in canon in Star Trek First Contact and expounded upon in Enterprise and Discovery. I talk about this distinction in my video about Khan's empire, link in the description. While the conditions that ultimately led to World War III had their roots in the eugenics wars of the 1990s, the continuous conflict itself is said once again to commence in 2026. Like the eugenics wars, one of these central issues, actually the central issue that causes the war to break out, is genetic manipulation and human genome enhancement. Call it a second eugenics war. It is the year 2026 when Colonel Philip Green, the despotic militia leader, commands a faction of violent eco-terrorists whose actions lead to 37 million deaths. This is treated as a separate figure from the 30 million who died in the first eugenics war, meaning between these two conflicts, the body count is higher than the number of civilians who died in the first two world wars combined. Some have also speculated that further root causes for this type of conflict lie in the political destabilization of several European countries during the 2020s. As we learn in the Next Generation episode The High Ground and the Deep Space Nine episode Past Tense, two years prior to the start of World War III, Ireland has been reunified through violence rather than peace, and France is torn between the Neo-Trotskyists and the Gaullists. This type of political hyperpolarization definitely seems like it would be conducive to violence, and of course for the first couple decades of World War III. Such conflict would be marked less by the threat of nuclear exchange and more so by, well, biological warfare. World War III is also denoted as the first world war that is fought primarily by factions instead of nation states. We can see parallels to both of these developments in our modern wars. Factions in the Syrian civil war, for example, include opposing groups claiming to be the legitimate government of Syria, as well as the US-allied Revolutionary Commando Army, and of course, ISIL. And of course, numerous leaders have used chemicals like sarin gas and other biological weapons against their own people and the armies of other countries. Star Trek's Third World War takes both of these elements to their extreme and introduces additional complexities, such as the use of narcotics to control soldiers. The factions are of a different nature than just opposing governments within a single territory, however. They are cross-border alliances that wield the influence of global superpowers. The Eastern Coalition of Nations is one faction mentioned in canon, in fact the only one specified by name on screen. First mentioned in Star Trek First Contact, the Eastern Coalition, or ECON, was always intended, according to production sources, to be a stand-in for China. The ECON would routinely launch missile attacks on the United States and its allies, as alluded to in the film. The exact nature of the Econ's political structure is never defined. Various novels posit it's an alliance of countries like China, India, Pakistan, and others, although the idea that India and Pakistan would form a military alliance seems like kind of a stretch. Ultimately, it is possible that the Econ is an extension of Chinese imperialism. More on that in a bit. While I'm down here, 
hundreds, even thousands of bombs are being exchanged, several in the multi-megaton range. For context, a one megaton blast over New York City would result in 1.3 million immediate fatalities. These bombs have yields hundreds of times larger than the ones dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki combined. In fact, the most powerful nuclear bomb ever designed, the Soviet Union's 100 megaton Tsar Bomba, generated a fireball radius of 7.92 kilometers. And the biggest nuclear test ever conducted, which was on a 50 megaton version of Tsar Bomba, generated a shockwave that circled the globe multiple times. More likely, though, a nuclear war would be conducted with bombs that are only a few megatons in yield. Probably something between the B-83 nuclear bomb, the most powerful U.S. weapon currently in active service at 1.2 megatons, and the B-53 bomb, the most powerful U.S. weapon in active service until 1997, which yielded 9 megatons. A variant of the B-53 warhead was equipped on the Titan II missile system until it was dismantled towards the end of the Cold War, and the Titan II happens to be what was used as the outer casing on the Phoenix, Zephram Cochran's experimental warp vessel. Anyway, those who don't instantly die would suffer from radiation poisoning, the symptoms of which can include nausea and vomiting, spontaneous bleeding, diarrhea, and severely burnt skin that may peel off. Dying could take from several hours to several weeks and 15% of survivors will eventually die of cancer as a result of radiation exposure. The detonation of a single Dongfeng-5, China's current 5 megaton ICBM, would also create a fireball radius of 2.39 kilometers, a moderate blast damage radius engulfed in fire of 7.83 kilometers, a light blast damage radius of 20.1 kilometers, and a thermal radiation radius of 21.3 kilometers. This means that everyone who isn't instantly vaporized inside the fireball would still receive third degree burns. But these people may not feel much pain as the burns will destroy nerve endings. In densely populated cities, millions would die immediately and millions more would be injured. The heaviest damage would happen within a 3.72 kilometer radius, with air 20 psi over pressure, causing even heavy concrete buildings to collapse, and fatalities would approach 100%. And this is to mention nothing of the fallout, which could stretch downwind for hundreds of kilometers. Multiple bombs of this yield would have to be dropped on each city to reach an estimated death count of half a billion, though many of these deaths could be people dying of radiation sickness weeks after the initial detonations. Either way, virtually every major urban area in every corner of the globe New York, New Delhi, Moscow, London, Karachi, Jerusalem, they're all being targeted. One source claims that the econ has stricken first with the New United Nations, a rump successor of the UN comprised of Western governments, acting in retaliation. Okay, remember how I said that the econ may be the logical conclusion of Chinese imperialism? Well, in the decades leading up to this, China has been concentrating more and more political and economic clout in its region of the world. The econ may be an outgrowth of the very real Shanghai Cooperation Organization, or Shanghai Pact, an economic, political, and security alliance created in 2003. Among its members besides China, well, several former Soviet states, as well as India and Pakistan. That's right, that's how China, which currently possesses a relatively small nuclear arsenal, could gain access to enough nukes to rival the United States. The Shanghai Pact regularly conducts military exercises among members to promote cooperation in defense against terrorism and external threats. Its partners include ASEAN, or the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, and it comprises nearly half of Earth's population. 
The missile attacks are accompanied by cyber attacks and additional aerial bombings over smaller targets, such as the one over Richmond, Indiana, as seen in the Discovery episode, New Eden. After the immediate attacks, conventional military forces mobilize into an offensive position as the Econ launches a land invasion of the North American continent. Think Fallout. Many ground soldiers will be lost in the battle between the US and the Econ. And even in the aftermath, there will be little in the way of major urban infrastructure left to defend. Rural areas will, again, be the last vestiges of modern civilization as warlords compete over remaining resources and people like Green carry out further atrocities against war-weary populations. Just how bad is the aftermath going to get? Well, besides the collapse of national governments and the ensuing skirmish over resources, nuclear fallout from the obliteration of major cities will threaten the health of survivors. Disease, famine, economic destitution, and a new rise in authoritarianism. These are all understatements as to the severity of this post-World War III period in human history. Climate scientists have written about the effects that even a small nuclear exchange, for example, between India and Pakistan, could cause. So much smoke would be produced that it would lower global temperatures below those of the Little Ice Age of the 14th and 19th centuries, shortening the growing season and putting two billion people at risk of starvation. Ira Helfand, a director at the Anti-Nuclear Physicians for Social Responsibility, calls the scenario a nuclear autumn. The severity of this conflict could be even starker in the event of a truly global war involving yields, like I said, far beyond those of a bilateral exchange. The collapse of governments is one thing. This could spell the extinction of the human race. The period following the detonation of nuclear weapons is known as the post-atomic horror. It lasts from about 2053, the end of the war, to at least 2079, the year of the trial that was shown by Q to the Enterprise crew in Encounter at Farpoint. This post-atomic horror is marked by the breakdown of civil society, the denial of rights to alleged criminals, and also an extended nuclear winter. This nuclear winter in particular would affect crops and other necessities for comfortable human life. During this time, the various war-stricken populations of Earth would fall victim to anarchy in some places and overt fascism in others. Colonel Philip Green even advocates for the euthanization of several thousand radiation-stricken people. He frames this genocide as rejecting the impure and casting it out. The new United Nations would have fallen by this point, and even after first contact, leaders on Vulcan would be skeptical that humanity was really ready to venture into the stars. A paper in the Journal of Geophysical Research paints a grim picture of what would happen in the absolute doomsday scenario of a nuclear winter. According to the paper, the roughly 150 million tons of black smoke rising from burning cities and other areas would spread around to most of the planet over a period of weeks. This would plunge temperatures on the planet's surface by about 17 to 20 degrees Fahrenheit for the first few years, before coming back up by about 5 degrees Fahrenheit over the next decade. Cities in the Northern Hemisphere would suffer the worst of the blow, suffering the coldest temperatures, though the entire globe, and particularly the global food supply chain, would be affected. 
global precipitation would also fall by about 45%, and if that's not enough, this nuclear exchange would deplete the Earth's ozone layer, allowing large amounts of ultraviolet light to reach the surface and harming ecosystems. According to the paper, for years, a Caucasian person could not go outside without getting sunburned. Using the most optimistic outcome for a global war that kills over half a billion, this means that even 10 years after the conflict ends, in other words, by 2063 when first contact takes place, the environment would still be badly damaged and too much radiation exposure would continue to cause cancer in starving humans. This would mean that Colonel Green's calls for euthanasia of radiation-stricken people would spell a death sentence for, indeed, millions of people. Also, this could partly be the reason that Cochrane looks older than he actually is in first contact. James Cromwell was 56 years old during the time of production, but Cochrane's canon birth year is in the early 2030s, meaning he was in his early 30s in 2063. Various sources account for this discrepancy by speculating that his aged appearance is, in fact, the result of radiation poisoning. Even if his birth year were retconned to be earlier than 2030, Cochrane and many of the other civilians at his facility in Montana would still be at high risk of developing cancers later in life from cumulative exposure to UV radiation and slow poisoning from radioactive fallout. We become privy to quite a bit of relevant information about the post-atomic horror's effects on human society through Encounter at Farpoint. One culture that we bear witness to during Q's simulated trial has resorted to near barbarism. New legal systems that have popped up around the globe are characterized by martial law, criminals are guilty until proven innocent, and judges hand down summary executions. As Captain Picard observes, such cultures have taken the credo, kill all the lawyers, a line from Shakespeare's King Henry VI, literally. Picard further remarks that due to these and other factors, many parts of Earth continue to be in a state of chaos well into the 22nd century. This chaos would entail things like gang rule over entire regions, such as by the drug-addled Fourth World mercenaries who fought on behalf of factions like the Econ in World War III. While all of this is going on, Cochran also helps usher in a new era for humanity in spaceflight. The 2063 first contact with the Vulcans becomes the defining moment in human history as it sets humanity on a new path towards a more enlightened state. While conditions deteriorate during the final quarters of the 21st century, the seeds are sown that will later blossom into the idealistic society of the 22nd century, with a resource-based new world economy taking shape. In future videos, I may dive deeper into the details surrounding the formation of United Earth and how humanity could have achieved true prosperity. In the meantime, I hope that this has been an informative take on just exactly how Earth's World War III could have unfolded in the Star Trek universe. This video took almost a year to write, shoot, and edit from start to finish. I've been working on it off and on for most of 2021 so I could deliver a quality product for your entertainment. I want to thank everyone involved in assisting in the production of this video, and I want to thank you for making it possible. Without the support of my subscribers, and especially without the support of my patrons and YouTube members, I wouldn't have been able to make this, and I mean that sincerely. If you want to see more content like this, signing up to become a patron or a member today will help make that a reality. And you'll receive other benefits like behind the scenes photos and videos, exclusive polls, merch discounts, and more. Links to those, as well as my social media and merch store, are in the description. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to leave a thumbs up down below and don't forget to share it. That stuff really helps me out. I'm really interested to hear your thoughts in the comments. If you haven't subscribed yet, be sure to do that as well so you won't miss future uploads and click the bell icon to receive all notifications. We'll be back next week to our regularly scheduled programming here at Orange River. Live long and prosper.
But first off, look at all this condensation. That's absolutely insane. The absolute state of my hair right now. And the world. Look at this. Look at this. I've had this for six years. And just now, I punch a hole in it. Ugh. I can breathe again. I'm gonna die from radiation poisoning, but I'm, I can breathe again. Guys, guys. You have got to try this. <laughs> I don't know where I'm going with that. 